Welcome, everybody. We've got a whole bunch of people just joining, and with Zoom's new restrictions, they've, they're putting everybody in wait rooms. So hopefully, uh, as you're joining here, you're able to connect your audio and you can hear me. I'm going to... Uh, you can turn that off, Cameron. That off. The wait room? Yeah, uh, but I'm not sure how. <laughs> oh, um... Enable weight room. No. There we go. <laughs> Enable weight room. Kimberly, you need to mute. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm hurting. Okay, so uh, Jimmy's uh, been gracious enough to offer to host uh, or to lead the discussion for us tonight, and I am very thankful for that. Uh, and I know that uh, he likes to begin things on time, so out of respect for him <laughs> and that, I would like to get things going. So um, let's uh, let's begin with a prayer, and let me let me see who's lurking here. Um, Gary, Gary Gibson, can I ask you to offer a prayer for us? All right, there we go. Sure, that'd be great. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful we can be joined together tonight. And please bless us that we may have our minds and our hearts open, that we may learn from these parables and know the mysteries and of the symbols. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, just as a reminder, I've got everybody that when they enter the, the room here, they're going to be auto-muted. This is designed to be a discussion. I think Jimmy's going to want people interacting and talking. Let's practice good hygiene and mute or unmute yourself uh, only when you're going to speak or make a comment. Um, to, to make it easy, if you're muted and you have a keyboard in front of you, you can push the space bar and hold it down and talk as a temporary unmute, and then you can release the space bar and it will mute you again. So if, you, if you've got a, a computer in front of you and you want to make a comment, that's an easy way to do it. Uh, otherwise you might, you know, if your, if your video's up, raise your hand or, or, uh, something like that to show that you want to make a comment. This is an incredible turnout. Thanks everybody for being here. And, uh, again, thank you, Jimmy, for offering to, uh, prepare a little, uh, I don't know, leading of the discussion and, uh, take it away. Cheer, cheer in, go ahead. I just want to know why my name says not quite killed Kyle. <laughs> Ask your children. <laughs> uh, that's a special little feature that I put in just for you. Just, Love you. Yeah. All right. So I thought today, uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I was thinking um, is as far as, as flow of the, of the meeting uh, is that we would kind of take a, a, an introduction into parables in general. Um, Maybe talk about that and why you know you know what what what's the reasoning behind having parables or or using parables, um, and then we can kind of tra transition into actually reading the parable. Uh, it's pretty short. Uh, we should be able to read it in about five minutes uh, for those who who haven't who haven't been able to get a copy of the book yet. And then it'll be a fairly free form discussion about uh, the various themes uh, and just interesting things that people uh, want to talk about. Um, I don't, I don't have much of an agenda once, once we get there. Um, partly because, you know, I, I want this to be a discovery, uh, for hopefully all of us as, as we, as we, you know, try to come up in some ways with our own interpretations. Um, and that kind of leads into, uh, you know, how I wanted to start was, you know, why did Denver pick parables in the first place? And, and perhaps even at a higher level, why did our Lord use uh, parables extensively in his own ministry? Um, it's kind of an interesting question. So actually, I, I, I want to open it up right here now. You know, what, what is, how are parables different than, you know, actual purported true accounts? What can you do with parables that you can't do with, with those types of things? Um, any, any thoughts? Uh, Anyone? 
Well, the low-hanging fruit there is that you can teach stories, convey messages, have truths that are um, conveyed in a story or in a lesson like that, that uh, people can understand and interpret different ways. So, you know, the way that I read something or understand something might be a little different than the way that my wife does. And um, it doesn't make my interpretation of you less valid than hers or hers less valid than mine. They're, they're two different vantage points and views. And we both have different things that we could potentially learn from the story. Uh, it also could hide or obscure truths from those that, uh, that aren't prepared for them. Uh, and additionally, uh, it, it can allow reflection and pondering over time so that over time you get more and more out of it. You know, today when I hear a story, it's one thing, but as I, as I reflect on it uh, a year from now or, or, or 10 years from now, I'm in a different position so that the, the meanings can shift and change uh, and the same simple story could be so much more profound for different aspects of life as well. I would add too that in parable form, you can teach things that you can't say openly because they're veiled and those who can uncover what's behind there can learn the, the truths that you're veiling, whereas they still remain veiled to those who can't. So there's great truths that can be taught in parables that can't be taught in any other way. I, comparing parables to you know actual real life accounts, if you're telling the truth of something that actually happened, there are motivations set in place and there are reasons that it happened um, that are concrete. Whereas with a parable, you can, you, it tends to be a reflection of yourself. If you're reading through the parable of the um, the prodigal son, do you see yourself in the 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 son who who wasted his life, or do you see yourself in the jealous son, or do you, which role do you see yourself in, and what does that say about you and what you need to learn? It would it also adds to that that if the story is about a particular son and his brother and his father it's really easy to look at that and say, well, that only applies to them. I'm different. Abstracting it a level and saying this is a generic story makes it more broadly applicable for people to self-reflect in uh, to, the, to the message. Yeah, I, I, I like that because... Uh, you know, and, and as I've thought about this question, that, that, you know, sometimes when you deal with, with accounts, you know, the, it, it can be very easy to be distracted. Like, I mean, you have the account of Noah and how much of it is, you know, how, how much argument is there over, well, was that literal? Was that figurative? How big was the flood? Was the whole thing actually covered? You know, and whether that's with the story of, of Job, of whether it was the story of, um, you know, many of the Old Testament stories, you get into, you, you get diverted from what's the message that we're trying to learn, uh, rather than what, you know, what is it that, <laughs> you know, in, in, into the details that are actually kind of trivial and don't really add, or, or you know, don't add anything to the, to the situation. Uh, did anybody else have any thoughts about this? I also wanted to uh, uh, take a moment and talk about interpretations of parables for a moment. And uh, ask the question about, you know, having a canonical interpretation of a parable. Do canonical, canonical ones meaning like this is the intent of what the parable is trying to say? <laughs> Do parables have canonical interpretations? Anyone? It's a loaded question. <laughs> so, so in other words, is there a right way or a wrong way to interpret the parable? Correct. I don't, I don't think so. I think that... Uh, we see the truth in it that we're prepared to see. And so I think that's partly true. Uh, I would say, I, I would give as an example though, the parable of the sower. 
Um, that, you know, the Lord actually said, okay, well, this is the interpretation of the stony ground. This is the interpretation of the one that got choked up by the weeds. Um, so I think that there may be an interesting mix involved that, uh, you know, for perhaps some of the, some simpler parables or even aspects within a parable, there may be a canonical interpretation, but for the more nuanced ones or more complicated ones, um, I, I doubt that that exists. Um, you know, compare the parable of the sower to, uh, you know, the good Samaritan or, or uh, uh, the prodigal son. You know, there there is a lot more meaning and nuance that's involved in, in, in you know, the prodigal son than, than, you know, some of the other ones. Um, and so... You know, that's something to be, you know, be mindful of as we, as we study this, you know, that we're not necessarily trying to find the truth about or, or the meaning or the message of, of, of a parable, um, but rather, you know, what can we learn in this moment? And, and, you know, it's okay that our understandings evolve over time, and it's okay that other people have other things that really resonate with them and, and, and questions and motifs that they see in, in these parables that, that perhaps we don't. I think that's perfectly, you know, to be expected as, as we go through this. I, um, I, I think it depends on who the speaker, who's giving the parable and what point they're trying to get across to people that are ready to hear um, the principle, the parables trying to get across. Some people don't want to hear the truth. They're not ready for it. And, um, and sometimes it's used to put somebody in place. Abraham Lincoln was great with parables. Um, he used them to teach and he used it to put people in their place and humble them. Um, so I, I, I think sometimes there's a purpose to that, a specific purpose to a parable for those who are ready to hear that principle. Here's a question. Why 10 parables? Why not nine or 12 or seven or eight? Surely that question wasn't directed to me, Gary. <laughs> That's not fair. I, 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 it's directed to everybody. Well, one, it sounds good. Two, it's an even number. They, it was an easy um, read. And I, I don't think they were meant to be super complicated. So I don't think that's why you don't have 20 of them. I, I think it's just a good number. Um, you know, do like we're doing. Take one a week, 10, 10 weeks, and we're done. Um, you had to have enough to make a book. That's all. How many, <laughs> how many talks did Denver give in the original? 10. 10 talks? Yeah. 10, 10 is a complete cycle because of the way our, the way we count as humans, we have 10 fingers, and so we have a 10-based number system. And if the 10 parables, as Denver has expressed, were designed to be the temple endowment, but in parable form, then 10 to me signifies completion starting at, at zero and, and going all the way to 10 or the complete cycle to walk back to God's presence. Well, also the number 10 is all of a part. In other words, it's the whole or complete unit existing within like the, like, Adrian just said, but it's like the Ten Commandments, or um, there's so many different things with the number ten. It's just um, I don't know. It's just I don't think it was by mistake or to make it easy or short. I think, like you just said, it was. It's the number ten denotes all of a part, like you said, ten fingers or there's so much more to it and i think it can go as deep as we want it to go and look at it
One more question from my uh, side of things. <laughs> so Denver wrote these. Does that mean that Denver actually understands all the aspects of, of what's in them? Jimmy, do you think that he uh, dreamt these up or do you think that he saw these in vision or how do you, how do you, how do you say he come up? He, he, how, how do you suppose he wrote these or came about the ideas for writing these? I can't even begin to speculate on that. <laughs> well, I know number 10, it was not just a parable. It really happened. And I think what it was up to us to decide whether this is a true experience for him or not. I, as far as 10 goes, I had almost the same it's almost the same experience, a little bit different order, of course, different um, locations and stuff. But I, geez, I, I was like reading my own experience. So I think when it comes to number 10, this was something um, that he really experienced. Can I talk? Um, in the preface, it's, it's very clear that it, it wasn't just dreamt up and put together as a fun little book for you to read. It says, I hope you enjoy contemplating these 10 stories. They have been carefully composed. The words are deliberate. The more care you use in reading them, the more you should discover. So it was very deliberate. I don't think Denver uses idle words. Everyone is like, um, Kim Kimberly just read. Yeah. All right. Does anybody else have any other thoughts about parables in general uh, before we before we jump into the first parable? Well, Jimmy, you asked a question, and then I kind of cut it off. The question you asked was, "Does Denver understand all of these?" Um, I suppose that to some level, yeah, absolutely he does. But that's not to say that he's not still learning from them. Uh, I think that any of us, I mean, I, I look back at stuff that I wrote years ago that I, I really understood at the time. And there's different, there, there's new understanding based on a different perspective from, from life and experience now. So I, I expect that even, even he still learns from, from uh, parables like this. Yeah, so so that so uh, maybe let me rephrase the question then. Should we look to Denver to see his interpretation as the interpretation? No, I don't think so. He. I, uh, oh, sorry. He. It says in the preface, and I went out of the room for a minute, so I don't know if this was. Uh, touched on yet, but um, he says that there is no one interpretation for these. Uh, they are intentionally susceptible to different interpretations and layers of meaning. Um, and no interpretation is included with the book to allow the reader the freedom and fun of providing their own. So I don't think he um, he's going to give us his interpretation. He might give snippets of a few thoughts within parables here and there in his talks, but I don't think he's ever given interpretations of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, one of, one of the ideas that, one, one of the examples that came to my mind was actually Lehi and Nephi from first Nephi, where Lehi had his vision of the tree of life. And, and, you know, there's probably a lot more that he learned that he didn't share but Nephi came along afterwards and, and was like, well, hey, I, I want to see these same things too. And there were things that Nephi caught on to that, he, that, that you know, the angel told him, Lehi didn't, he didn't notice this. Um, and so I think that can be some of the fun of, you know, of, of going through these that, uh, you know, any of us can, can um, you know, notice new patterns and new things that, that perhaps have gone unnoticed uh, heretofore. Just to throw a wrench in that. <laughs> Please. I, I, I think it is possible to interpret wrongly. And what I mean by that is um, 
So I one time wrote a little blog post in the form of a parable and somebody who uh, was kind of anti-Denver, anti this movement, picked it up and said, look, look at this thing Adrian wrote. He just admitted that Denver is not God's servant and blah, blah, blah. And he, and he had this whole big interpretation of what I've written. And so I jumped because he posted it publicly. I jumped in and said, well, I'm the guy that wrote it. And that's not what I meant. And he wouldn't have it. He's like, yeah, you did. Cause I, you know, this and this and this, and like, no, really, I, <laughs> I know what I meant. Anyway, it is possible. I think that we could overlay something that is completely wrong or backwards on this too. So I think we ought to at least try to be sensitive to what Denver may have been trying to imply. Not to say that there aren't other ways to look at it, but we could get stuff dead wrong. Yeah, that is a fantastic uh, point and one I wholeheartedly uh, agree with. Um, that, that, yeah, this isn't, this isn't just because they can have many meanings doesn't mean that, you know, <laughs> that we're all, you know, that there's some sort of relativism going on here where, you know, just because it popped into my head means it's a valid interpretation. Yeah, definitely, De definitely uh, agree with that. All right, well, let's, uh, let's jump in. Uh, so I, I thought we would, I, I wanted to go through and read, read this in its entirety. It's, you know, two full printed pages um, and, and, and actually go through it straight through so we kind of get the big picture and then we can circle back and uh, you know, r really go go back and discuss any any themes that we want. Uh, do we have any volunteers that have a strong and pleasant voice to uh, to read for us that has a copy of the book? I can do it. Please. A busy young man was on his way when he encountered a man sitting under a tree on the side of the road. The man asked the young man to come and help him. There was something compelling in the man's demeanor, and the young man paused from his haste to help him. That day they sat under the tree and braided rope. At the end of the day, the man asked the young man to return again the next day and help. The young man agreed. They sat together again the next day and braided rope. At the end of the second day, the young man agreed to help, agreed to return. When the third day ended, the young man's hands were sore and blistered. He inquired how long the man intended to continue braiding rope. The man replied, until we have enough to make the net. The young man returned day after day for many years, helping the man until finally the man said, it is enough, now we will tie the net. Preparing the rope had taken nearly seven years and tying the net took seven more for the complexity of the work. These two labored together day by day. At length, the man said, we may now have enough. He fixed his eyes on the young man and asked, do you know who I am? The young man replied, I did not at first. It took a long time for me to see the wounds in your hands for the calluses caused by the labor of braiding and tying. But I have known for some time now who you are by your hands. The master replied, do you wish anything from me? The young man replied, no, not now. There was a time when I would have asked for more, but now I am content. After a pause, he added, master, there was a time when in the last months of braiding the rope, I believe my rope was perfect. And in the last year of tying the net, I believe our net was perfect. Then, said the master, the net has caught its fill, and I must go to labor elsewhere. The young man understood, and after coming to know the master thereafter, followed his ways. So one of the, so I'll, I'll start with uh, kind of a generic uh, observation, and we'll, we can you know, this, this can go wherever uh, people want it to go. For me, as I, as I read through this, you know, you, you see the master's actions and, and the nature of the master. And, and, and you get kind of a different vibe than of 
of who the Lord is from reading something like this than you would see in, in other places. And, and to me, this is, this is important because, you know, as the lectures on faith say, you have to understand God's attributes, characteristics, and perfections, uh, you know, in order to be saved. And while, you know, this doesn't get into the things that the, 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 the lectures on faith deals with, this presents a very different picture of who God is and how God acts than, you know, you would likely find, you know, uh, in, in, in most of our backgrounds where, you know, God primarily uh, has conversations with, with uh, you know, people who hold a title and who hold priesthood keys. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the primary interaction, uh, you know, and, and, and this one, you know, there is a much more personal uh, relationship there, one, one that's more intimate and, and familiar, um, and also one that's just less known. You know, at first you had no, no idea who, who, who he was, um, but was willing to, to do what he asked in, in the beginning. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, Free, free, free uh, floor now. So um, I was thinking uh, similarly to you, Jimmy, uh, in that this presents the the master in in a different way, uh, or, the, or God in a different way than um, maybe we would have thought when we were in, you know, different organization. Uh, in that, you know, we see that this is a that this is a man asking, um, asking a young man to come and help him. Well, I was thinking about how the Lord is trying to gather his sheep, and so um, is it. Is it beyond uh, his, you know, his capability to to ask us uh, if if he? I mean, this is a busy young man, right? He was going about his day. He was, you know, I, I kind of picture a, a someone like myself with my shirt and tie on and my bag on my, you know, on my shoulder and you know, walking where I need to walk really fast and. You know, I was, I'm, I'm always busy, but do I hear the voice of, of the man who, the, the young man did not realize, obviously, who it was, that he was actually the master until he did, did hear his voice. He did stop. He did apparently interrupt his life to, to help. And he didn't know why at first, but he did it. And in that way, he came to know who this, who this man was and recognized him as the master. So there's this, there's this gathering that, that, our, that our master does. And I think he is actively engaged in this with all of us if we will just hear him. So that's, that's kind of a diff, I don't know, just a different than what we might think that he's a, he's kind of a, a passive God that he just sits back at, at least Christ. Uh, does he really just sit back or is he actively trying to gather us? To, to piggyback on that at the first seven years, he's tying each of the strands individually and <clears throat> perhaps that has reference to each of us being willing to individually hear the Lord's voice and obey. And then the next seven years where he's taking those strands and tying them together to make the net, um, that's perhaps fellowships and the weaving of all of the individuals who hear his voice coming together to form 
potentially form Zion. So I, I had some thoughts about the beginning of the story. Um, I love those thoughts too. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so it's interesting to me that the the old man asked him to come and do a work, but the work was already the old man already knew what work needed to be done. And it reminded me of that scripture that um, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of men. And that that was the Lord's, like he knew that that's what he wanted for the young man and that the, he, he was inviting the young man to be part of that work. And I really loved that. And the young man just continued by his side and I loved it how long it took. I think sometimes when we ask for things from the Lord, we don't realize that as we're like as he's answering, it takes time and it takes molding of our hearts because that's the whole point of receiving answers and receiving him is that we change in the process. And so I, I just loved that the master had a plan. It wasn't this, so what should we build? <laughs> what do you want to do? You know, he's got this, he's got to work and we're all invited. He was just sitting there waiting. And I love the omnipresence of God, like Christ him spending time with each one of us doesn't take him away from either, any of us. And so he waits patiently for each one of us without it being, I mean, just in this ever present state. <laughs> it's really beautiful and it's really personal, his relationship with each one of us. That's what I had to add to the beginning. Thank you. I wanted to add to the beginning that um, he noted he was busy and he stopped and he noticed. I mean, that's that's the first goal for all of us, right? In our busy lives, can we stop to hear? And at the end of that, this this young man has no idea what the bigger plan or the bigger picture is. He's just invited to come back tomorrow. That's all. Just, he was invited and he said, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. And then as it moves on, the pain, the pain that he felt in his hands as he was doing the work. And so the pain of what it takes when you're listening to God and he's preparing you and he's preparing your hands to do the work, the pain that you might experience. And then it just just a beautiful story. But I does anybody get tripped up at the end of and then he leaves him. Then God leaves him. I I I can't tie that back, back together. I know we're not talking about the end right now, but it's only two and a half pages. And and two and a half page later, pages later, after the pattern goes on, then he says, mm-hmm. then he leaves him after however many years. I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's because he becomes a savior himself and he comes, that's, that's kind of our journey is to become a savior ourselves, And then God leaves us to go and do the work ourselves anyway. So to that question, Kimberly, I mean, I notice uh, it's not, it's not posed as uh, a busy young man and the master or busy young man and God or busy young man and the mystic guide, it's the busy young man and the man. The only difference between them is is progression, is age, right? Yeah, but eventually the man the name changes for the man to the master. Sure. And he he is the master the whole time, but I think the point in calling him the man and the young man in the beginning is just to show what the young man can become. And when he has become that then the man moves on to save more, to, to, to his next level of work. And I don't know that he necessarily <clears throat> leaves him at the end. He says he, now that the net has caught its fill, he must go and labor elsewhere. That's consistent with his scriptures that he has many sheep and he will visit all of them. <clears throat> and, uh, so I don't know that it was a permanent separation, um, but the, the young man clearly had been taught enough to be able to continue following the master without the master physically present with him. Or it's kind of like the 
the young man had got his cell phone number and was able to contact him anytime he wanted to. <laughs> That's good. He, he taught him, he taught him so, he taught him correct principles and he could now govern himself. Yeah, I'll still have to ponder on that. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting. I've been thinking about that too, Kimberly, because when it says that the young man thereafter followed his ways, it suggests that he went out and sat underneath the tree and helped others braid rope and then build nets. And so it definitely suggests that um, whoever this young man is, right, we kind of know who he is, has, is, is doing that right now. Um, at least to me, I think that's, that's not beyond the, the scope of, of, what, of what it can mean. And then we can kind of apply it to us and say, well, what, what would that look like? And how could we go out and do likewise? Maybe once we've been. When I press it, when I press it. Loud. Um, anyway, <laughs> perhaps once we've been gathered in design, right? If, if that is the net, um, we could then be sent out in a similar way, right? So this is, this is a cyclical thing and maybe it's not all the way till when we're the master, but at, you know, at a lower level, we can go out and help others braid rope and bring others in, right, in a similar way. What year was the beginning of the 14 years? Yeah, Gary, you're going to have to uh, put a little bit more context around that type of a question there, I think. Oh, put more context around there. Yeah, I don't know. I can. <laughs> well, there's, when you talk about time periods, there's initially a three day period that's called out and then there's a period of years and then there's two specific nearly seven year periods. And I think each one of those numbers is chosen intentionally and has meaning. Um, so whether we can point to specific years on the calendar and say Denver was referring to these things in his own life, um, I tend to think that those numbers are surrogates for specific meanings. Seven being the number of perfection or completion, one seven year period of, of rope and it, and he says at the end the last few months i think my rope was perfect and then another seven year period of tying the net only now it's not the last few months it's the last year that that the net was perfect um i think there's meaning there i'm not gonna try to delve into you know what the meaning is but it's it's worth pondering why those different time periods were chosen when you're telling the story i was thinking specifically about that it, uh, i caught you know the first the first seven year period is uh, actually it's 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 not quite seven years right it's less than seven years and the the matching time period for how long to get perfect to get perfect in tying the rope was the last few months right so say that first seven years is actually six and a half and it was the last few months let's call it six years to get good at it and then he did it for six months. And then the second period, it was seven years and a whole year that he felt like he was perfect at it. Almost six years and then a whole year. Yeah, yeah. So six years and then and then the year of perfection. Almost as if it took the same amount of time, but there was more labor to be performed uh, during the perfection period. Or uh, yeah, I, speculation at this point. But yeah, I, I think there's meaning there. I also have have uh, some some thoughts about the the three day period at the beginning, the, the challenges that he says he faces are, are, are somewhat different and the, the, the difficulty of the work, you know, my hands get, get chafed and hard, you know, on the, on the first day when somebody asks you to do something and you go do it, your motives are very different than the second day when he invites you back to do it again and going back to do it again, it, I put myself in that, in that situation and I would expect hopefully a different type of work the second day. 
a different a different labor that would be easier, something that would be um, maybe not quite so difficult to overcome, and uh, you know doing the set the same thing or something very difficult again the second day, you come back the third day, and and then you realize you know this is this is hard and there isn't an end in sight on this. How long is this going to take? At, at what point do you give up? At what point do you say, hey, you know what? I've got other things to 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 go about handling or doing. Um, in, in my own life, uh, when the Lord's asked me to do something, the, the first time that he asked me something hard, yeah, okay, I'll do it for the, for the Lord. The second time, yeah, golly, that's hard. I hope this doesn't go on very long. The third time, it's, you know what? I, I, I'm not prepared right now to do this. I need a break. Uh, this suggests, to me anyway, that I gave up about seven years too early. <laughs> maybe 14 years too early that it, it, it is going to be a grind. It is going to be work and there is actual hard labor involved and you have to, to be willing to go back over and over and over and over again, even when you're asked difficult things to do. I, I have a question. Um, now these parables are supposed to either help prepare for the temple, the coming temple, or prepare to accept ordinances. Where would this, do you think this parable would fit in preparing for new ordinances or principles in the temple? So there was um, something that was written on the, I can't remember who wrote it, but it was on the page that we were, that we're all on to even be on here, 10 parables or whatever, a post on the covenant chat thing. Anyway, but he talked about, uh, he put a quote on there from Denver and it talked about how um, this, the parables were to take you from a point where you don't you aren't familiar with God and, and it's like an endowment experience. So I think of it as it's the beginning, a beginning walking back to the presence of God and um, thinning the veil until you receive him. And so I think that this one where, you know, we start out with a, a busy guy that's, you know, there's, something compelling. I was going to mention this on the first page. It says there was something compelling in the man's demeanor and the young man paused for his haste from his haste to help him. And it made me think about that scripture in Romans where, um, the spirit birth witness to our souls that we are, we are, um, I actually children of God and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And that, it's interesting because I think we have this, you know, we p human beings have this reach for God, for something more. There's something missing, um, this connection that we desire. And it starts here with an old man. And he said he was compelled to stay and work with him. And as he did, um, he continued, even though it was really hard. And so I just think about, you know, the endowment. You start with nothing. And then you grow to know who God really is. For me, it also reshapes the nature of why we're here and what the what the objective is. So you know, in, um, an undisclosed billion dollar, unnamed multi-billion dollar corporation, uh, you know, you could go to its uh, meetings and come away with the idea that the best way to please God is to say, not watch NFL games on Sundays. Uh, and, and if you're a woman, don't wear uh, shirts that, that don't have sleeves, you know, like that's, that's the nature of the, of the challenge that we're facing is that there's this big list of don't do this, don't do that. Um, 
And if you don't do those things throughout your life, hey, you'll be rewarded at the end. This parable rejects that, uh, that, that, that concept to me. And that in, instead, it kind of reframes it in a, in more of a, hey, are you listening, you know, listen to this voice, find this compelling person, um, and, uh, you know, go and, go, and, go and do what he says. Um, and the nature of what he asks for could be way different than what you have in your mind as, as you know, what's important. Um, and that, you know, really, it seems that the nature of these, these like focal points in our lives are kind of rare. You know, this isn't like a, you know, you, you, you sin this week, go and take the sacrament, and then, you know, all is forgiven, you know. If the busy young man would have kept on walking that day, he'd have lost something real that day. He'd have missed out, um, you know, and, and I'm not saying that he wouldn't have ever had another chance, but it seems that, you know, it probably would have been years and years again before he would have been, you know, given an opportunity of that nature to, to connect with the master. I'd, I'd add too, I see a strong theme that maybe sets the tone for the temple in its entirety starting out as a stranger to God with a different path and different priorities and goals and being interrupted in that path we were on, forcing a change in path, no, not forcing, but choosing a change in path and a change in goals and priorities, ultimately learning to do the work of the Lord first in our own life, in our own heart, and then with others in a community setting, ultimately not only choosing the master's path and becoming a follower of him and a friend and a co-laborer, but ultimately then becoming what he is. So that in that short story, you have the whole summary of starting out as a stranger to God and ending up on the path to being God. And um, to me, that's the, that's the theme of the temple in its entirety. It's all encapsulated right there. Um, and <clears throat> I, I like that, Adrian, uh, because it, it made me think of, you know, there's two time periods here. Uh, certainly there were uh, some different time periods for Denver. Uh, I look back at my life, there's been kind of two time periods. One where I went through the motions, but really did want to serve God. Um, even though it was a lot of it was just going through the motions. And then there came a point of realization where um, things needed to be different. Uh, there was a, there was, there was actually, uh, well, I had to shed unbelief and, and change and things, things came into clearer focus after that. Um, including, including uh, my relationship with God. And um, I think this might be kind of a, a template for each of us, just like it was for this young man. Um, yeah, it's uh, a lot of, we, we wanted to do what's right. We wanted to get something uh, out of it. I think the question that he poses, uh, do you wish anything from me? I mean, at that point, <laughs> no, he, he had come to that realization and maybe he had, had figured out what he needed to figure out at that point. Just like sometimes, well, just like with many of us, I think, we've come to the realization and and have, I don't know, made, made a similar transition. Um, because I think Denver, 
it was the same thing for him uh, in, in, in some respects. So anyway, just, just some thoughts about why it might be laid out like two time periods and I don't know. Well, I, I know for me, this young man kept going back. He wanted, when he figured out it was the master, he, he wanted to be with the master. And there came a point in my life, I wanted to be there and have that personal, more of a relationship than I ever had in my life. I wanted that. And it sent me on this journey and led me to you people, um, which was totally, totally unexpected. Um, having been in the LDS faith for 50 years and never dreamed that I'd be on this journey. But it all started with a prayer saying, I want to know you better. And this young man kept going back and laboring with the master. And he wanted to be there with the master. And I think that desire um, is very important in our lives that, that we want to be there. We want to toil. We want to, to sit beside him and learn and just be in his, his presence. At the risk of saying too many comments, um, I wanted to share one, but this one doesn't come from me. It comes from my wife, Tasha. So um, think of it as her talking. She just, uh, she's, she's laying down over here. And uh, she just said, um, when you think about the 10th parable, it begins also with a busy young man who is on his way and who is approached by a beggar and doesn't give him money, goes back to his car later, you know, tries to find him the opportunities passed, follows, it's followed by a very long period of, of reshaping and it ultimately ends up with him becoming a completely new kind of a person. And so that um, it's almost like a chiasmus you start out with the tale of the man and the rope and the net, and you finish with a practical application of a young man on his way who ends up um, taking a completely different way and knowing the Lord. I like that. I, I like a lot of what has been said. To Karen's point, one of the things I think is nice about this parable and one reason it can either replace the temple or prepare us for it is, um, I mean, I still find myself in this young man's shoes a lot where I'm going on my way and I'm not really listening, right? And maybe I've, I've done some braiding or I've done some work or I've done something and yet it's easy to, to kind of be like, okay, I'm there, I've made it for a little bit, but this is, I don't know, maybe the difference between the young man and this young man is, um, or I don't know if I'm young anymore. I don't know where that, where you stop. Uh, let me know. <laughs> but, but there's, is, is that he went back day after day after day after day. That, that feels like a, a key point. Cameron made something, a similar point that it's just a, I think it's a powerful theme of this. And we see it throughout many other, other of the parables that hands and labor um, young man, like these, these themes kind of come back around a couple times. So when I had read this a little bit earlier, um, there's the part at the end where it says, Master, there was a time when in the last months of braiding the rope, I believe my rope was perfect. And in the last year of tying the net, I believe our net was perfect. And I was thinking about how sometimes it's interesting that... Um, I remember feeling this way, like, oh, I've done so much. I've sacrificed so much and I've done all these things. And it was kind of um, not like there, there is a sense of pride in there. And, um, and I think I realized that's not the Lord's intended desire, that the journey isn't to boast in our own progression or things that we have maybe checked off the list or, 
that we've accomplished or that we've, you know, pierced that understanding, but it's that it's our masterpiece. It's, and in the last, and he says, um, and in the last year of tying the net, I believe our net was perfect. And it's this perfect symphony with you and the Lord. It's not you alone. And I think that the whole point of the gospel is to lose yourself. And, um, and I love that at the end, it said the net has caught its fill. And that was the purpose of the Lord was to, you know, the, it was in the transformation of the young man. So I just love that part at the end. Those uh, moments of perfection, that theme Denver returns to in November of 2018 at when Natalie had her conference when he talks about life being a series of those little moments where you experience perfection. And um, I thought that was such a, a great concept because, I mean, isn't that kind of eternal life is as those moments of eternal life become more of a woven pattern um, rather than isolated moments out there. And they feel isolated at the time and then you see how connected they are and how they've made you whole. That's true too. It's beautiful. Yeah, I think that the idea of, of creating a net um, where it's, we're not going to have this, this one big experience that's going to make us great or perfect or suddenly convert us all the way. We have to do the work of tying all those little threads together every day in our lives, taking the little opportunities to do the right thing and to reach out and to cultivate more love until we have enough of those threads to make a rope and then until we have enough of those ropes to tie the net and then actually tie it together in order to um, rise up enough that we're essentially caught, you know, the, that the fisherman has caught us in, in his net and that we can confidently stay there. Yeah, I think for me, you know, applying the parable to myself, it's always, the challenge is always stepping outside of the busyness, stepping outside of the haste, stepping away from all of those distractions and, and still, you know, remaining, still going back day after day after day in the midst of the pain still going back consistently to to have that interaction to tie those knots to to do the braiding to do the hard work day after day and i know that for me it seems like <laughs> i i feel like i'm still stuck at the very beginning of this parable you know getting to the end where i can say i've done something perfectly seems like it will never happen because I feel like I still have a hard time just letting go of the haste. I think another in interesting thing is, is we think of often the masterpiece of, you know, the final net, can we get the final net done? But it's in the actual tying and doing all of the things to prepare the rope that the masterpiece is created. And so you know, in ourselves, like we're not the Lord, the Lord's work isn't done with us with this great thing, you know, it's with everything in between that we do and that the, and all the little things that change our hearts to be selfless, to be stripped of pride and to be like him. I think sometimes we, um, get to the point where when we're, you know, on the, was it the third day that he was having pain in his hands and recognizing that. And sometimes we can't get 
beyond that pain. We're so focused on that that we can't that that day takes many years. That that one day spans many, many, many years that we can't take down that. And I was just thinking with what you were saying, what happens when the pain is too great? What happens when we stop? And so it's, that's an interesting thought too. When we feel like it's too great, like it's never too great, but what happens when we feel like it's too great or we remember how busy we are and continue on? I was thinking if I were the man, I mean, kudos to the man for showing up every day. He just kept showing up. He had no idea. The, on the first day, he, didn't, he wasn't told that, oh, this is what's going to happen. Here's the trajectory plan, and we're going to learn to do this, and then we're going to, these ropes are going to get bigger, and the ropes are going to get better, and then you're going to learn then to make a net. He had no idea what the end plan was, but he just kept showing up day by day. And he continued to show up even when it hurt and when it was painful. And to me, that's the example of this, this man that, that I would want to emulate. Um, continuing to show up. There are times when I'm envious of people who have lots of time and they're not quite as busy as I am. And I mean, what is busy? Busy is a, is a state of mind, I guess. And it can be defined in different ways, but just showing up every day. He, who knew in the end that he would be a master at making rope and then creating nets and then uh, gathering people. He had no idea that that was the end goal or result. And yet he just let, he just let the man and then the master continue to guide him. Um, can I comment um, back to Marie? Is that how you say your name, Marie? Yeah. Hi, I'm Robin. Um, about the pain, it's interesting. Um, I don't look as at pain as something that makes necessarily means that we want to give up. I think my experience has been that it makes me seek for the Lord that much more because that's where the relief is, that's where the relief comes. Um, so I don't know if that if that helps you with that. Yeah, I was just asking kind of a rhetorical question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but that's great, thank you, that's great. I, I, I had some, some thoughts about the busyness. Um, You know, it, it's curious that they that, that that's the adjective that gets used, um, and that essentially what what the the man or the master represents is the exact opposite of of you know what the young man was. <laughs> that uh, you know, as a busy person, having some guy on the side of the road be the one to be say, oh hey. I need you to stop and, and come and help me braid rope. Um, how inconvenient is that? Um, you know, and in our own lives, whether it's busyness or something else, you know, that, that it's a curious pattern that, that the Lord tackles us on our, you know, on, on, on one of our weaknesses or, Maybe not even weakness. I mean, I don't know that being busy is a weakness per se, but, but you know, again, it's just really inconvenient, you know, and, 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 and 
really this stands as, as the, the entire parable to me kind of stands as, as the counterpoint to the New Testament account of the rich young man who, you know, the only thing we know about him is that he was rich, but he at least knew something about the Lord. He, you know, had, had, uh, you know, lived many of the commandments his life. But when it came down to the one thing that was really inconvenient for him, he, he couldn't give that up. And, and, you know, he, he, uh, he lost something because of it. Phil, go ahead. So this, um, your comment also makes me think of, uh, you know, Joseph Smith was, you know, he was willing to, to stop and do what he needed to do. Um, and, and even to the point of, of suffering, like we've, we've been talking about the pain that, that, uh, you know, this man's, this man developed in his hands uh, for the braiding of the, of the rope. And, you know, it makes me think of when Joseph was in jail and, and asked him, you know, how long will you suffer this to go on? Where is thy pavilion? And the Lord said to him, um, you know, art thou, uh, man, I can't, I, the phrase escapes, but uh, basically have, um, the son of man has descended below all things. Are you, are you greater than, than him? Um, so the, the, the man, the man replied, uh, with, in response to the, the young man's question, you know, to how long he intended to continue braiding until we have enough to make the net. Um, is, Going back to one of the first comments, uh, Marie, it might have been you that uh, said that, um, well, what's the Lord's purpose in all of this to bring to pass uh, the eternal life and, and or the uh, immortality. Immortality, <laughs> eternal life, man, thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, and certainly, uh, you know, this net is symbolic of, of that. Uh, I just, I, I find these words, these very precise words intriguing and certainly full of this meaning, but it, it made me think of, of Joseph Smith's suffering and his questions makes me think of, you know, Lehi's murmurings, uh, and then he was chastened a little bit and, uh, you know, are we also, do we murmur? Do we question why we have to, you know, go through the, the pains and agonies of life uh, as we try to, as we try to serve him? So um, just, I don't know, just some thoughts. Okay, sorry. Here I come. Um, so I was somebody would just caught my eye. Seven years of tying and then seven years of making the rope. And then at length the man said, We may now have enough. We may. He's not sure. And to determine whether or not they have enough, he fixed his eyes on the young man and asked, Do you know who I am? So apparently the entire purpose of the labor is whether or not we recognize and know the Lord. And I think it's, it's especially interesting to note that this young man didn't recognize him right away or even soon. And this was years. And he says, I, you know, I didn't notice you right away. He, he was aware that the Lord would have, have the prince in his hands, but they were so, covered by by calluses and and the marks of work on his hands that he didn't notice them right away and and he couldn't use that to recognize him and i think it's a great example of of the lord 
it, it's not just that he was crucified. He's, he is constantly laboring, willing to get his hands dirty and out there doing whatever he needs to be done, tying rope with all of us individually. I noticed that there's an echo of the temple in there as well when when uh, he asks, um, do you wish anything of me? Um, you know, in, in the temple we hear, what is wanted? We, we read in, in uh, scripture uh, various accounts that there's an, an opportunity when you gain a certain level, then the Lord asks. And... Um, you know the 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 preparations the getting back to, to the to the preparations for the temple we can see echoes here and and what's necessary in order to achieve that uh, certain level or that that achievement in time thank you but we should expect that of our our own preparation and our own heart to gauge ourselves you know how close am i to being ready for something like that would i would i would I do I have a laundry list of questions? Do I have a laundry list of requests? I mean, I want I want to be rich and I want bigger muscles and I want a refrigerator with a padlock and or is it enough? Is it have I already learned enough? How close am I? Would be a good gauge, I think. Uh, this reminds me anyway of that. Yeah, a couple yeah, of things, uh, if I may. Uh, the correct answer when you're in that position, when the Lord says, well, what would you ask of me? The correct answer is nothing. It's enough. Um, that's one of the things that this parable teaches us. Um, and another thing is interesting. They spend 14 years building a net that they never use. 14 years building a net that doesn't matter. It was never about the net, right? It was always about building the man, building the busy young man into a man. And, uh, and then that leads to another thought, simply this, the Lord spends 14 years working one-on-one -on -one with one person. I mean, what's time to the Lord? It, that time is the one thing he has an infinite amount of that we don't. And so he's willing to spend whatever time it takes to help each one of us go as far as we can go. Yeah, uh, another thing I notice, um, the young man says, I believe my rope, I believe my rope was perfect, his rope. And in the last year of tying the net, he says, I believe our net was perfect. It was his rope, but then when it came to the net, it's our net was perfect and i i think we've overlooked that point that point also reed you mentioned that the net was um useless uh they built it for nothing except to train or to to for for the man himself to become who the lord needed him to become i think the net could be a metaphor i mean the net caught the man um, even if it was one person that was caught uh, in it, um, that was enough. You know, we the the Pisces. We talk about Pisces with the two fish and the one that's continuously circumnavigating the earth, and the other one that's that rises up. Um, there's a lot of of talk about nets, fishers of men catching the nets, the, or using the nets to catch the fish. And I think that the net itself is uh, a metaphor for those who will listen and be caught up uh, in the, the hearing the, the Lord and becoming who he wants them to become. Anyway. So I wonder how many, when you think about a net and a net, <laughs> when you think about a net 
and a rope, I would, it, it's not one piece of rope that it takes to make a net, right? So in um, early on, it says how he inquired how long the man intended to continue braiding rope. So ro that could be in plural. How we're who else are we helping in the process? I know he's sitting with the Lord, but he's listening. He's listening to the Lord, and he's doing what he's asked to do. So this is how he inquired how long the man intended to continue braiding rope. The man replied until we have enough to make a net. So how many ropes need to be created to make a net? And then at the very end, it says, Master, there was a time in the last months of braiding rope. I believe my rope was perfect. And in the last year of, try of tying the net, I believe our net was perfect. So I, I think there's, there's some room to believe that, that multiple ropes and as you're working on your own, you're also helping to braid the rope of others. Um, I had some interesting thoughts. I was just intrigued by the fact that um, they were braiding rope. I have really long hair, so every day I'm braiding my hair. And a basic braid requires three strands. And that caused me to think about, I think it's in Moses, where it talks about there are three elements required when we're born into the world. We have spirit, water, and blood. And our rebirth, the sons and daughters of Christ, also requires those same three elements. I'm not quite sure. I wanted to get your thoughts on how does that fit into this process that they were going through over these years of time, and how does that apply to us? You stumped everyone. That's an interesting question. I had never considered the uh, the uh, the three components and or, or limiting it to only three. I I've never tried to put a number on the number of ropes or, or net. So yeah, but it's but a little other cool thing. Well, with, with braiding, I mean, three is like your basic. I mean, if you just have two strands, I've never made rope, but I work with hair, and I mean, if you have two strands, you can do a twisty thing, but three is the the basic that you need just to do the basic braid right um and if you've ever ever made um i think it's pronounced holla holla bread there are different numbers that you can use to make braids you can do three you can do five you can do seven even um so it's not it's not that it's set at three um that was just what i was automatically drawn to just because i'm working with my hair every day and doing three strands Likewise, on the notion of blood, water, and spirit, uh, the idea that once the man chose to follow the master, what proceeded was many years of work. It was busying the hands, doing the labor, which by which he, he came to know his master. Um, it occurs to me that uh, another perhaps interpretation for the three strands, when you think about the Godhead, we got to throw out the, ga the Catholic one that we all got misled with. And think about the actual members of the Godhead, the Father, whom we recognize entails the Father and Mother as a unit, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, whom we recognize is our own spirit in a state of holiness connected to them. Therefore, if you're braiding rope, and ultimately at the end, the braiding that you're doing is perfect, a perfect union between Father, Son, and yourself in a state of holiness, Holy Ghost, means that you have ultimately not only come to um, make that connection with God, but to do it for so long and so well that it finally becomes a perfect connection. And at that point, now we can begin to tie the net. Just a thought.
Somebody had mentioned that um, the, the Platt brothers uh, had given an interpretation of this parable um, in the comments section at the beginning. Um, and Cameron, you had mentioned that we were gonna read that. Is that something that you have access to? Uh, as in we were gonna read the parable. The, yeah, the comment was that, oh. that the parable had something to do with seven years and then seven more years. And so, yeah, we were gonna read the parable and we have. Um, I, uh, I think Glenn Martineau posted on Covenant Chat uh, some uh, information, interpretation from the Platt brothers uh, I'm not sure how much of it was about this parable uh, specifically. Uh, I think they have some some interpretations about timelines and uh, what the seven-year periods might be uh, with connecting dots for, for fulfilling prophecy. Um, I haven't studied theirs enough to to speak intelligently on it. Uh, it's you know something I'm looking forward to over this weekend actually. Uh, but yeah, that document can be found on Covenant Chat and downloaded there in the thread, the introduction thread that I posted for this. It was, if I remember correctly, it was primarily about Denver uh, and his relationship to this movement. So seven years in his life and what he was up to and then the next seven years. I would add too that for this parable, um, I posted earlier in the, in the chat a uh, link to a blog post Denver did where he kind of started to take this particular parable, the first parable apart, and uh, propose a bunch of questions that the reader should ask themselves. And I thought it was a great start because he, he ultimately stopped the mill and said, well, that's enough. I'm not gonna rob you of discovery. But he set a pattern for a way to view the parable and to ask every question. Um, you know, he starts out with a busy young man. Why busy? What does that mean? Why young? What does that entail? Can you be an old man and still be a young man? What's the difference between young? Does it mean young body or young spirit? You know, all, he had all kinds of questions that you could consider about that. Why is the man sitting under a tree? What does that imply? Why is the tree next to a road? What is the, why does the tree need to be there? On and on it goes. So I would, I would encourage you to hit up that, that blog post that Denver wrote and just start pondering some of those things it because to me it gives an insight into his thoughts as he was preparing the parable why he intentionally chose each motif and in some cases each word why did the young man have to be busy he chose busy for a an important reason and then he gives a little key he says isn't busy you know how does that relate to busyness or business and what does that have to do with this parable anyway check it out I think that's a meaning, meaningful uh, experience, meaningful endeavor, not just for this parable, but to see how much he picks it apart, just how many questions he's asking and, and picking and prying. There are nuggets that are, that are found all over the place in this, as we're seeing. I mean, for a, a page and a half or two pages, uh, you know, we've been, we've been talking for a while, and I think there's still more to uncover. This the same can be said for all of the parables. Uh, as we're moving on over the, the, the coming weeks, we can, we can go to that level of depth for all of them and, and ask deep questions about why this and why that. So I want to I want to uh, I, I go back to the part about the contentment because the, the, you know there seems to be kind of you know competing ideas within the gospel you know this one kind of says oh yeah you need to be content and then on the flip side you know. Well, obviously, we want to improve ourselves and, and rise up and repent and, and, you know, change and transform ourselves. Um, any thoughts on the balance between those or, you know, or are these actually just different <laughs> things that use the same word? Uh, any, any, any thoughts on contentment and, you know, how it fits in with our 
lives and existence. Well, con contentment can also mean peace. I know I found that in my life this past year that I never had before. Um, and in a way, it is a contentment, a peace that I have that I've never had before. And so um, you got to figure out what you mean by contentment. For me, being having peace in my life, I'm content. So I think too that along the way, the man found the answers he was looking for with the work that he did with the Lord. So he was not wanting for anything else. He was satisfied and at peace with where he was at and who he was with and his relationship with him and the work that they had done. I've been muting you, Marie, from time to time because you got a lot of background noise. So oh, I'm sorry. As, uh, if you're wondering why you get muted, that's why, just so you know. Mute away. Sorry about that. I've got little people still up. <laughs> uh, any other thoughts or uh, questions that anybody wants to share? Well, just on that topic of contentment, so is it possible that this process that the man was going through and each of us is to bring us to that place of recognizing that we can be content? Does that make sense? I think that certainly could be it. I. So I think there's a stark difference between someone who feels the need to be constantly busy and, and doing more and being more and achieving more and someone who is content. Um, if I, someone said once that, that we are the only people, we are the only ones that are not content with where others are in their journey. The Lord looks at people and where they are in their journey and what they're learning and what they have learned. And he is content with where everyone is because he has that broader view and he knows what's happening. We are the ones that tend to be discontent and feel, you know, the need to do all of the things instead of becoming what the Lord would have us become. I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> well, I think that's a great application in that, that contentment is kind of the opposite of busyness. Busy young man on his way uh, is now content and asks nothing more when he could ask everything. I, I have some thoughts on contentment. Um, I was trying to, who's, who's, um, who's like the, uh, person in charge of this meeting? Like if I raise my hand, who sees it? Uh, I guess that'd be me. Oh, that's you, Jeremy. Okay. So mm -hmm. I raised my hand. Okay. Um, well, the first thing I have to say is Adrian, your hair is rather remarkable and glorious. And that just made me my night when I just saw that. So that's, that's off topic. Um, okay. So on contentment. I have a couple thoughts. I'll try to be brief. Um, earlier, we were discussing um, the, the passage just before that, uh, the phrase where he, it's, it mentions the word content, but it, it says, the master replied, do you wish anything from me? And um, my thoughts are these. Um, has anybody, has everybody seen the, the new Aladdin I imagine most people have seen the new Aladdin or they've seen the original Aladdin. Um, so what this brings to my mind is when um, the lamp is first rubbed and the genie comes out, 
and he's this great and powerful magical being that's um you know uh otherworldly um to aladdin um you know he's this great and powerful kind of scary so i i believe that what he says to him is almost very very close to this um you know he 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 basically says to him what what would you have me do right he has these three wishes um and, and the context of that relationship um i think is probably where a lot of people's minds go uh with this with this kind of thing the master replying do you wish anything from me kind of in the relationship of uh, the great and powerful genie um, asking, you know, some lowly person that question. And it comes from kind of a, a place that I'm not sure. Um, Denver wrote this parable. I'm not sure that's the tone that's probably accurate in what he was intending. I'm assuming, I'm assuming we're all in agreement that the master is the Lord. Um, and so as Adrian mentioned, um, I, I also believe that every word in this, in this um, parable is really important and, and really meaningful. And um, so, sorry, I'll try to wrap up, but um, where I'm going with this is I, of all the things that Denver has, you know, that have come through Denver to us, uh, to me, the things that I'm the most grateful for are the things that he his eyewitness accounts so the in particular the garden of gethsemane and resurrection morning are the two big ones for me and uh as far i mean nothing like that at all existed in our scriptures before that um and so that to me is hum that's probably the biggest by far for me so m most of the, a lot of things draw my mind to those two events um so the, the 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 this whole parable is he's referring to what i'm taking as the lord as the master and where that takes my mind is in the scriptures um in the testimony of john uh when the first day of the week when mary magdalene comes early um and I'll, I'll I'll skip skip some of this, but it's worth looking at. Um, she stood outside the sepulchre weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and see, sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why why do you weep? She says unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus says unto her, woman, why do you weep? Whom do you seek? She, supposing him to be the gardener, says unto him, sir, if you have borne him from here, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus says unto her, Mary. She turned herself and says unto him, Rabboni, I don't know if I pronounced that right, which is to say, master. So by, by this account, and in Denver's eyewitness account, she is the first witness of the Lord resurrected, and she addressed, he has many titles, and she addressed him by the title Master. And I think that's pretty significant. Um, I know if you listen to Denver's eyewitness account of that morning, um, he describes how Christ's, uh, his suffering was public, and it was designed to humiliate him, and it was known, everyone, um, was a lot or a lot of people were there to make fun of him and mock him but that his greatest um, triumph was private um i think that when denver uses the phrase um do you wish anything from me i think the pro appropriate context from the, the master is reversed from the genie analogy i think it's almost like it's almost like a, an, an ask if, if he, the master, is good enough for the man. 
Um, I think um, Denver described the Lord in in the account of resurrection morning as as meek. And I think if you if you don't envision that that question, do you wish anything from me? I do not believe it should be viewed in the in the great and powerful um, addressing a lowly person. I think it's probably a little bit more um, um, flipped flipped around. I think I think a lot of people. We all know that we will all um, every time every knee shall bow. Um, I think there will be a lot a great many people who are not content with the Lord himself. And um, I, I believe that he is very meek and that when I read, do you wish anything from me? I view that as um, coming from a very humble place. So that's, that's my thoughts on contentment, maybe flipped a little bit and looking at from the context is if we're content with the Lord. So sorry, that was kind of long, but that's my thoughts. Interesting. So to, to kind of <laughs> restate in, in my words, then we're looking at the Lord, you know, that sometimes people look at the Lord as kind of a vending machine of like, oh, okay, I need this. I need that from you. This is, this is what I, you know, this is, this is what I can extract from you out of this relationship. And at the end, it, the, the relationship, is flip that you know that that's not that's not the way the, the, the man views the Lord at all but but rather is like hey yeah I've been very happy to get out of the 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 rope braiding and the and the net making and uh, hey that's been great thanks <laughs> Anybody want to comment about the importance of uh, of a fourteen year period? Are there are there examples of fourteen year missions or ministries in the scriptures, uh, for example, or uh, the the division of labor there, seven years uh, preparatory and and then and then seven years at a higher level, uh, maybe administration or or something along those lines. I mean, the only seven and seven that comes to my mind is that of uh, uh, Jacob working for Laban to get Leah and then Rachel. Um, I can't conceive of any any tie-in, though, uh, other than the, the two seven-year periods. If you were going to consider seven-year periods, um, as being literally seven years, then the two thousand the uh, the talks the the ten talks began in two thousand thirteen, as my wife just pointed out, which um, would put us seven years along right now or this fall anyway. So we're at the just shy of seven years, nearly seven years point right now. If we wanted to talk about the ten talks as the beginning of the current ministry. Um, interesting that there's the big push right now that land needs to be obtained uh, ultimately so that a temple can be underway. Um, it would be tempting to try to overlay that and say, golly, we're, we're at that midpoint in the two seven-year cycles, but that's pure conjecture on my part. Well, I think that's along the lines of what the, the, the Platt brothers uh, wrote about this parable specifically uh, with that time frame, starting with the, with the 10 lectures uh, and, and moving forward seven years uh, and then having it change to, to uh, temple preparation and, and actual fulfillment administration, uh, expecting that to, to now essentially consume the next seven years. Um, 
it's interesting to, to think about that. I mean, a, a, a counter timeline uh, that I once put together. Uh, yeah, not counter, an alternative timeline. Um, I actually went and, and, and looked at, at, a, at a 40 year ministry, which is fairly common or more common anyway. And, uh, you know, you could trace that back to angel visit and, and whatnot. And at, at, uh, 40 years, it, it would put it in, uh, 2024, the, the completion of a 40 year ministry for Denver, uh, and, and counting back from that 14 years, it's 2010, which is uh, when he started his blog, when he started an outward public constant stream of teaching and preparation uh three and a half years later is when he started the 10 talks three and a half years after that was a covenant and um we're now at the next three and a half year point which would uh, potentially put a temple in three and a half years coming up to the completion of 2024 at the eclipse it's interesting to put different possibilities for timelines like that um yeah, I'm not sure that they're that, that, that that's as, as simple or as clear or as clean as we want it to be. Um, particularly considering this parable, the seven years and the seven years was was preparatory almost entirely to to knowing the Savior, to knowing the Master. And um it's it's clear at least in, in Denver's track that happened a long time ago. That he he came to know the master long ago and and it is not something that i believe anyway is is happening now uh so i i look at the parable as far more applicable to to me as a person uh, individually instead of trying to overlay that or fit it to to his life or his pattern though if there are some things that are just too much to say as a coincidence if you ask me I just don't have all the answers. So another plug to go to go read the Platt's uh, Platt Brothers article. I, 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 there, there's some interesting stuff there. There's a lot of scriptural references that that uh, really add to this, and you know maybe it'll uh, make you think about some things. Something else Tasha just pointed out was that the Second Comforter, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't it published in 2006? I thought it was 2007, but I'm not sure on that. I thought it was six, which would make the 2013 beginning of the talks the end of a first seven-year period. And uh, this would be another seven years after that now where we find ourselves. But yeah, looking at the Platt Brothers paper, there's a lot of interesting ways you can uh, interpret. Marie just asked on chat where the Platt Brothers paper is. Uh, it was posted by Glenn Martineau on the original introduction thread on Covenant Chat. And because we've talked about it so much, I'll make sure that I post it with the recording of this meeting that I post um, so that it's, it's easier to find. Uh, also, as far as seven and seven, uh, Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dream was also seven years of uh, plenty followed by seven years of famine. Um, again, whether that has any bearing or parallel, uh, it's not clear to me, but there's at least a couple of uh, scriptural examples of the seven years and seven years. It seems like there was a similar time period put on ministry uh, amongst the um, in the Book of Mormon, uh, Alma the Younger. Uh, his mission was something along those lines. Uh, the Sons of Helaman. I'd have to go study that out some more. It seems like the threat by fourteen years, something like that. I think there's more threads there that we could pull than, than we expect. I think there's probably more pattern there than we recognize.
Yeah, even in even in church history, there you know the church was founded in 1830. Seven years later was when they you know through 1837 was kind of the Kirtland period or the Kirtland period ends, and then uh, 1838 through 1844 kind of marks a, a secondary period ish i don't know that's a great fit but it's at least it's definitely 14 years from 1830 to 1844 all right any uh any last uh, comments, thoughts? Sounds like we're kind of naturally wrapping up. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, Cameron, did you have any closing uh, logistics or anything else you wanted to do? No. I, uh, well, just wanted to thank everybody for coming. I have really appreciated the discussion. I think that this has been uh, wonderful. I, I uh, I'm looking forward to uh, spending some time over the, the next couple of months really digging into each of these uh, each of these parables and, and hearing different perspectives and different insights. I, uh, I am really hopeful that that the flavor and, and the comfort level uh, increases every week with with uh, our desire to share and and uh, to uh, to really engage, I, I think the conversation has been great. It's uh, exceeded expectations. So thank everybody, thank you everybody for that. And um, I'll uh, save this recording and post it. Um, not sure when that'll show up, but watch for that. And otherwise, looking forward to seeing you next week. And yes, it did start at eight. Jay asked. Yes, it did start at eight o'clock. And next week, I think the plan is the same time. And I think Brian Bowler is going to be leading the discussion on parable, on chapter two, the second parable, wise men. So very good. Uh, mountain daylight time zone, Idaho time zone <laughs> is when we started at eight o'clock. So we started at an hour and 49 minutes ago, whatever time. Yeah. For I, I was late. I thought I was. I thought we were, I'm in Arizona. We don't have daylight savings time. Yeah. So I thought I was on the same time. So I joined an hour. Later. I'm sorry. You're, you're the only, you're one of the only true states that doesn't mess with daylight savings. <laughs> yes. But in this case, it hurt me more than it helped me because I thought I, everyone was already talking and I thought I was, I didn't realize I was an hour late. I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to do that. Very good. Well, if uh, there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and end the meeting and we'll see you all next week. Thanks again. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. <laughs>